Okay. Very good. <sighs> Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavirjan Karava Vahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om Oh This is one of those days I'm a little Thank you Chaitanyam Sarvagam Sarvam Sarva Bhuta Guha Shayam Yat Sarva Vishayatitam Tasmai Sarva Vide Namaha Good. Thank you uh, for mentioning that. Welcome to you all and welcome also to many students who are attending this class online. Um, we're finally finishing this chapter 15. The chapters are getting longer. This chapter was 54 verses. The next chapter, I think, is 74 verses. I'll talk about that uh, next week when we begin the uh, chapter. <coughs> Remember, th uh, the chapter had this unusual name, na anyat anyat prakaranam, na anyat anyat prakaranam, which means one thing cannot become another. And we talked about it at the very beginning of this chapter, and we noticed that the second verse has nothing to do <laughs> with the first verse. So I suggested that that was like a um, hypothesis that was going to be proved through the course of the chapter. One thing cannot become another is an indication of the unchanging nature of consciousness which was indeed a major topic throughout this chapter. So that was Shankara's rather cryptic way of introducing the chapter, a chapter which is mostly focused on unchanging consciousness, and he used that expression, one thing cannot become another, which we discussed at the very beginning of the class. Um, before I forget, I want to apologize to the online students. I failed to put the uh, slides up on the uh, video. Um, I put a note, I think most of you saw it, my uh, comment uh, on the video that said, it, that said, gave you the link to our website where you can find the PDF version. And if ever I forget to put the slides up, you all know you can go to our website and the entire PDF is, is there. Okay, uh, with that, introduction complete, we come to the final verses, four verses left in the chapter, and it's conventional at the end of a very important work or chapter to discuss the pala, the fruits, the benefits of the teaching at the end. That's a convention that's pretty much always followed, and we'll see that in today's class as well. Shankaracharya describing what is the benefit of discovering the truth that your consciousness is unchanging. And just, bef just to round that in our experience, how wonderful it is when you get it and when you're, <laughs> like right now, when you're experiencing dizziness or if you experience sadness, or anxiety, or anything else, how wonderful it is to know that you're okay. Because consciousness doesn't get dizzy. <laughs> consciousness doesn't get sad. Con your, the consciousness, which is your essential nature, remains utterly unaffected. So that, in, in a very brief way, summarizes the pala the benefit of these teachings. We'll see Shankara's explanation of that, of that pala. Huh? Why aren't I getting that here? <laughs> Sorry, I got another problem here. Why is that that? So, if y for those of you wondering what's going on, I'm advancing the slides in the room, 
Oh, that's why. Okay. The slides are not advancing. The slides are not advancing. Let me see if I can relaunch this. This is all these buttons. A little, little tricky. So that was supposed to relaunch it. It's not launched. All right. So why? Give me just. <laughs> I come out here early and set it up, set up the uh, system, but sometimes unexpected problems occur. So we'll try this again. Okay. Shift F five. There we go. You have to learn all this arcane stuff. If you're using PowerPoint, you need to know the difference between F5 and Shift F5. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been using PowerPoint for a long time. Okay, now we're, now we're ready. Sorry for the interruption. Yatoktam brahma yo veda Yatoktam brahma yo veda Hano padana varjitam, Hano padana varjitam, Tatokte navidhane na, Yatokte navidhane na, Sasatyam naiva jayate, Sasatyam naiva jayate. Yaha Veda, one who knows, Brahma. Brahman meaning the reality because of which you exist. So often Brahman becomes a very abstract reality. This is you. The reality because of which you exist, of course, is consciousness. Pragnanam Brahma, the one of the uh, Mahavakyas which says that consciousness is Brahman. These are not two separate fundamental realities. There cannot be two separate fundamental realities. So Brahma here, Brahman, uh, in the undeclined form, is your consciousness, the truth because of which you, which you exist. Yahaveda, one who knows that Brahman, Yatoktam, as taught in this chapter. And how is it taught in this chapter? Hana Upadana. Varjitam, Brahman being free, and let me use the word consciousness here. Consciousness being Varjitam, free from Hana and Upadana, from my gestures, you might get the meaning. Hana means rejection, Upadana means acceptance. So Brahman consciousness is not something you can accept or reject it's not a thing in the world. My, my, my guru liked to make this particular joke in Hindi. He thought it was funny. I don't know if, if it is or not. You can be the ju judge of it. He wouldn't, when he was talking about uh, not being one more thing in the world, he would say, Orek cheese, nahi hai. <laughs> And I've, as an American, I find it interesting that the word cheese in Hindi <laughs> <laughs> means thing. <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's language for you. <laughs> so, Brahman is not one more thing in the world. Brahman is you. You are the one who can do rejection. You are the one who can do acceptance. Therefore, Brahman consciousness is not subject to either rejection or acceptance. Brahman is not an object. Brahman is you. And going back to Brahman as in his more abstract sense of the absolute reality because of which everything exists, that absolute reality can only be known as yourself. That's what that means. We won't get into that right now. But the reality because of which everything exists can only be known as the consciousness which is your true nature. That's exactly what the Mahavakya Tattvamasi reveals. Okay, continuing here. 
simple Sanskrit. He says that you gain this knowledge, yatoktena vidhanena, by means of this vidhana, this methodology. Yatha uktena, as taught in this chapter, as taught throughout this text. And it's wonderful when we use that word explicitly. Vidhana means method. Oftentimes we we'll use the word jnanena, through knowledge, and that leads people to the wrong conclusion that you have to ascertain all the knowledge contained in these scriptures and that's how you get, you get enlightened. But as we've said again and again and again and again, this is not about, enlightenment is not the result of the acquisition of knowledge. And I know that statement goes contrary to many interpretations of, of uh, Shankara's teachings, but it is so true. No, in, light, in, in fact, Shankara himself says, jnana meva moksha. Moksha is through knowledge alone, but knowledge in the sense that, actually Shankara's use of knowledge here is different than information. Shankara's use of, of knowledge there means the discovery of your true self. And we've had this discussion before, so we won't stretch it out. But this word vidhana removes that confusion because vidhana means method. These teachings, have you heard me say before, are a method of guiding your personal process of self-inquiry to lead you to look within and discover what the ancient rishis discovered. The word jnanam doesn't quite convey all of that, but the word vidhana certainly does. Na jnana means knowledge, but vidhana means method. And more than anything else, Vedanta is a method of self-inquiry. Vedanta, as you've heard me say before, Vedanta is not a collection of philosophical teachings, right? Look at the difference. And that's a conventional understanding. Vedanta is a collection of, of Vedantic teachings. Not! <laughs> Vedanta is a method of self-inquiry. So, one who gains a knowledge that, that Brahman, that one who discovers one's true nature as being not acceptable and not negatable, yatoktena vidhanena, through the methodology described in his teachers, saha satyam na eva jayate, that person most satyam truly, most certainly, it's used as an adverb here, that person absolutely is not najayate, is not born again, not subject to rebirth. Shankara here referring to the condition we call videha mukti, the liberation after you drop the body at the end of your life. We contrast that with jivan mukti, liberation while you're alive. And we often focus on vidhe, on jivan mukti, the freedom that you enjoy here and now, the freedom in knowing whatever is going on in your mind or body doesn't affect you at all. That inner freedom is called here jivan mukti. And we often emphasize that because, a uh, little technical point, um, other schools of Vedanta, like Vishishta Dvaita and Dvaita Vedanta, do not stress Jivan Mukti. In fact, Dvaita Vedanta denies it altogether and says the only way you get liberation is at the end of your life by going to, to Vaikuntha Loka, by going to some heavenly domain. So to focus on the uniqueness of Advaita Vedanta, we often stress jivan mukti, freedom while being alive. Now that being so, and I'm leading up to an interesting point here, these 
uh, next, these three verses where Shankara is talking about the benefits, the pala of these teachings, he focuses on videha mukti and not jivan mukti. And that seems, at least it seems to me, unusual to put so much emphasis on videha mukti. It's emph- that it's emphasized in other traditions, we would understand. But that Shankara is emphasizing it here at the end of the chapter seems a little bit unusual. And w- when I see something unusual like that, I, I, for, my own, for myself, I try to understand it. And, and the commentator didn't mention anything about it. So let me share with you an interesting observation. And that is, Videha Mukti is considered to be superior to Jivan Mukti. Why? Now, what are the fancy words? What are we saying? That moksha, after your body dies, is considered to be superior to moksha while you still have your body hanging around. Why? And the answer is because while your body is still present, there is the appearance of separation, the appearance of duality, the experience of duality, right? Mm-hmm. Right now, if, if you happen to be enlightened, and you might be, I have no idea, <laughs> but if you are enlightened, you will continue to experience duality, absolutely. And that experience of duality gives rise to the sense of being separate or individual from the whole. The sense, the feeling, an apparent sense. It's not real. If you're enlightened, you know it's just a feeling. You know, sometimes feelings aren't real. You get these funny sensations in your body. They come, especially people get this during meditation. Sensations come and go in the body. Okay, they come and go, who cares? They're just sensations, they're not real. So the enlightened person might have the feeling of being separate or individual. The enlightened person knows, however, that it's just a sensation and doesn't take it seriously, like an itch. (laughs) It's just, just a sensation. So after the body dies, there is no possibility of experiencing duality. There is no possibility of having that false sense of separation. Gone. Gone forever. And for that reason, the Deha Mukti, that is the uh, liberation after death, is considered superior for that reason. And that's perhaps why Shankara is stressing it here in this chapter, at the end of this chapter, as he does in the next verse. (coughs) Janma mrityu pravaheshu, janma mrityu pravaheshu, patito naiva shaknuyat, patito naiva shaknuyat, ita huddhartu matmanam, Ita uddhartu matmanam jnanadhan yena kena chata jnanadhan yena kena chata This is very poetic language. Patitaha, one who has fallen. Fallen into what? Janma mrityu pravaheshu. Into the pravaha, into the flow of janma and mrityu, the current of worldly life. The, uh, and here, this uh, pravaha flow is usually uh, said to be the flow of a river, the current of the river, inexorably carrying you from birth to death, to birth to death, to birth and death. In each birth, you are subject to suffering. There's a, a elsewhere, Shankara gives a, another metaphor. Instead of pravaha, he talks about it being more like a whirlpool. And the significance of a whirlpool is 
you keep going round and around and around. Pravaha means you're going downstream. So in a way, this, this whirlpool is a better metaphor because you're stuck. <laughs> you don't go any, you're just going round and round and round. And then he continues, na eva shaknuyat, it is not possible to uddhartum, to lift oneself, atmanam, to lift oneself, itaha, out of that whirlpool. So you're stuck in a whirlpool, you're just going round and round, and it's impossible to extract yourself. I think it's in, it, it's sh definitely Shankara, and I think think it's in Viveka Chudamani, where he, he gives us this whirlpool metaphor. And he gives the example, I think, I haven't r studied that text for many, many years, but someplace he talks about I an insect stuck in that whirlpool. How will the insect get out? On your own, you've had it. <laughs> So he is in this metaphor, he, discuss, he describes that a passerby, one who is kripalu, a very kind passerby comes, sees this insect stuck in a whirlpool, plucks gently, plucks the insect out of the whirlpool and puts it up on the side. That kripalu, that kind a uh, uh, bystander person uh, representing in this metaphor the guru. And it happens to work like that without, without some assistance. It's unlikely that you will extract yourself from this whirlpool of life and death, showing the importance of the guru. You know, peop some people resist this. Why? Why is a guru uh, necessary? And we definitely see in some extraordinary circumstances people getting enlightened without a guru. But those are extraordinary people in extraordinary circumstances, those stories. If you are an ordinary person in an ordinary circumstance like me, we need all the help we can get. So it's, and it's very pragmatic. You know, when a guru is available to help you, what is the point of saying, oh, we don't need a guru? Yeah, to me, it's, it's counterintuitive. Anyways, nice, nice metaphor. The guru lifts you out of the, meta out of the um, like the passerby lifts the insect out of this whirlpool. The guru lifts you out of this cycle of birth and death. Of course, every metaphor has a limitation, as we've discussed so many times, and a guru doesn't physically lift you up. In fact, if you want me to lift you up, you're out of, <laughs> out of luck. <laughs> I'm not very strong. <laughs> but it, that, that's not what the metaphor is about. The guru is the one who blesses you, imparts unto you the knowledge which breaks you free from the cycle of birth and death. That's what the uh, last line says. Jnanat anyena kena chit. Now we have to contain, na eva, you have to bring down that na. So the, um, it is impossible to extract yourself from this whirlpool of birth and death, jnanat anyena kena chit, by any means other than knowledge, jnanat eva, by any means other than knowledge. <coughs> now, <coughs> just to reflect on the earlier statement, Jnana Deva Mokshaha, when Shankara says that the only way to get enlightenment is Jnanam, excuse me, <coughs> Jnanam in the sense of personal discovery, some people resist saying that sounds awfully dogmatic. It's like when the Christian says the only way to salvation is through Jesus. Pretty dogmatic, <laughs> you've heard that before. Here Shankara says the only way to liberation is through knowledge. 
So is Advaita Vedanta as dogmatic <laughs> as, as Christianity? And we've discussed at great length how the problem is ignorance. The problem is the failure, to, the problem that causes suffering is failure to recognize your true nature as Satchitananda Atma. Due to that ignorance, avidya, kama, karma, some of you remember that sequence? Due to that ignorance of your true nature as Satchitananda Atma, due to that avidya, you naturally perform karma. You try to solve your problems and come out of that suffering. And due to that, that I'm sorry, you, uh, due to avidya, you have kama, desire, sorry. You desire freedom from suffering. You desire all the goodies in life that can make you feel better. And you desire to avoid all the things in life that can make you feel worse, kama. So from avidya comes kama. From kama comes karma because you act on those desires. And from karma comes this whirlpool. Because you keep collecting more karmas, which cause you to get reborn. Reborn ignorant, karma, karma, reborn ignorant, <laughs> karma, karma. And this is that whirlpool. And here, the, the simple point is this. The statement, jnana reva moksha, jnana meva moksha, is not dogmatic because it can clearly be demonstrated that the fundamental problem, as my guru liked to call it, is ignorance. If the problem is ignorance, the solution is knowledge. <laughs> if, if your plant is all shriveled and dry, the solution... Uh, I can proclaim, the solution is water. Is that dogmatic? <laughs> the solution is water. That's not dogmatic. It, the, plant <laughs> the plant is dried out and shriveling. So don't, just because it may sound dogmatic doesn't make it uh, dogmatic. Okay, let us continue. Bhidyate hridaya grantish, Bhidyate hridaya grantish, Chidyante sarva samshaya, Bhidyante sarva samshaya, Chiyante chasya karmani, Chiyante chasya karmani, Tasmin drishta iti shutehe. If you studied the Mundaka Upanishad, that would sound very familiar. It's one of the verses most commonly uh, quoted from that important Upanishad. We taught it here long, long ago. The Upanishad says, is describing, is describing enlightenment. We're talking about the pala, the benefit, the fruits of these teachings. And the, uh, the Rishi here, here Shankara is quoting the ancient Rishi, the Rishi who says, Bhidyante, Bhidyate, Hridaya Grantihi. Granti you may know is not, but this is not an ordinary knot, this is a knot in your heart. And a knot in your heart is not the kind that you treat through cardiac surgery. <laughs> the knot in your heart is a metaphor for ignorance. So heart is frequently used as a metaphor for mind. So what is a knot in your mind? Ignorance. So hridaya grantihi means ignorance, to use my guru's terms, self non-recognition. Ignorance. And that self non-recognition bidyate gets severed. You cut a knot and here you sever that ignorance. Then following that, chidyante sarva samshayaha, sarva all samshayaha, all doubts, chidyante are cut away as a result. When the knot of ignorance is dissolved, all doubts 
fail to persist. Um, do you have any doubt that I'm sitting in front of you? Yeah, it, we don't doubt what we have discovered. <laughs> However, if you haven't, uh, if you're, uh, if you came in here with your eyes closed, you may hear me talking, but you don't know for sure. I'm sitting here, I, I'm making. I just go for these silly examples. I don't know where they come from. Imagine you came here with your eyes closed, and you're sitting here to right now with your eyes closed. You hear my voice but it could be a recording. <laughs> <laughs> so you have some doubt. <laughs> is, he really, is he really sitting there, or is it a recording? There was a commercial about 30 or 40 years ago. Is it live, or is it Memorex? Memorex was a brand of recording tape. <laughs> Do any of you remember that commercial? Long ago. <laughs> Who uses recording tape nowadays? Anyway, let's see how old that commercial <laughs> is. Anyway, when you s open your eyes and you see me sitting here, it's not possible to have any doubts. Chidyante sarva samshayaha. Then chiyante sarcha asya karmani asya for that person. Uh, karmani, all of the past karmas, the infinite amount of sanchita karmas, which has been keeping you going in that whirlpool for an infinite number of prior lives, all of that kshiyante gets removed, gets destroyed. Isn't it interesting that the length of time you've been in that whirlpool is irrelevant to getting out. If you just fell in, or if you've been in that, that whirlpool for thousands of years, thousands of revolutions, it makes no difference. In an instant, with the Guru's help, you are removed from that. Then the suggestion here is no matter how much karma you have collected. According to the doctrine of, of karma, you have an infinite collection of uh, infinite store, as it were, of, of karma, but it doesn't make any difference. In an instant, all of that goes away, like when the guru plucks the insect from the, um, from the whirl uh, whirlpool. Tasmin drishte para pare is how the verse comes in the uh, Mundaka Upanishad, Tasmindrishte, when this is seen, discovered. And here again, nice to use that word drishta, in fact, often used. Shankara likes the word jnanam. Shankara was a great scholar. I, you can not be surprised that Shankara would be, be very inclined to use the word jnanam. The ancient rishis were not so inclined to use the word jnanam. This word drishta is more often used. Seen, discovered. The interesting, t I've never thought about this before, this comparison before the orientation of a great scholar like Shankaracharya and the earliest of the rishis who personally discovered these truths. Their ancient rishis are most likely to use terminology like this, tasmindrishte, when this is discovered. When what is discovered? Para apare, when the ultimate truth is discovered and the apara, the so-called lower truth, refers to worldly existence, to discover that worldly existence depends entirely on Brahman. This, for its existence, that's how the verse concludes. Iti shutehe, thus it is said in the Mundaka Upanishad. And that leads us to the very last verse of uh, chapter 15. We have a longer meter here. Mamahamityetarapoha sarvato. Mamahamityetarapoha sarvato vimukta deham paramambaropamam vimukta
ಮಂಪರಂ ಸುದೃಷ್ಟಸ್ರಾನುಮಿತಿಭ್ಯಹೀರಿತ ಸುದೃಷ್ಟಸ್ರಾನುಮಿತಿಭ್ಯಹೀರಿತ ವಿಮುಚ್ಯತೆ ಸ್ಮನ್ ಯರಿ ನಿಶ್ಚಿತೋ ನರ ವಿಮುಚ್ಯತೆ ಸ್ಮನ್ ಯರಿ ನಿಶ್ಚಿತೋ ನರ Start in the last climb. Um, yadi, if asmin nishchitaha, if you are firmly established in this truth, then naraha, a person, vimuchyate, is liberated. Nishchita, being firmly established, this perhaps hints at the necessity for nididhyasana, Earlier chapters in our text have focused a lot on Nididhyasana. The chapters we've seen more recently are more focused on Manana. So we understand Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana as being the main practices of Advaita Vedanta. Here he says, Mama aham iti etat apohya sarvataha. Etat apohya, having negated this, sarvataha, completely, having completely negated what? Mama aham iti, mama, mine, aham, I. And o- these two little words are often used to describe the problem of identification. And the problem of identification is so obvious from a Vedantic perspective. Whatever you are identified with becomes a source of suffering. You know, if you're identified with your car and somebody dents it in the parking lot, it becomes a problem. If you're not identified with your car, If it's just a vehicle, uh, suppose it's a rental. <laughs> if, if you've rented the car, you're not identified with it. Who kids got another dent? That's what happens in parking lots. So this is a problem of identification. You're identified with, with your car, you suffer. This, is, this one will strike at least some of you. If you're identified with your grown children, you will suffer. And why grown children, even young children, when your children are sick, when your children are having difficulties? Children are not you. They're individual living beings with their own karma, their own, their own free will. But when the parent becomes identified, you know, children are supposed to be a source of happiness, aren't they? <laughs> How often? <laughs> Children become a source of suffering. Problem of identification. Then more obviously, when you identify with your body, body's got problems, you suffer. You identify with your prana, your life force, problem. You suffer. You identify with the condition of your mind, you suffer. And if you don't identify with any of that, If your vision is, I am unchanging consciousness, and the problems of my mind, my prana, my body, my children, and my car <laughs> don't affect me at all, where is the suffering? Freedom of suffering is due to disidentification. And that's what Shankara describes here in that first line. Etarapohya, having removed all kinds of identification. Vimukta deham param ambara upamam. Sudrisht, I have to get the verb here. Su, su, uh, sudrishta shastra anumitibhyaha iritam. Uh, that, that participle is a verb. Iritam. What, what is described here in this chapter 
for one who has removed all identification, that's the first line, for that person who has removed or having, may just be more grammatical here, this chapter, having removed all identification and iditam, having declared the padam in the middle of the second line, having declared the padam, the state, what kind of state? Vimukta deham, the state of enlightenment following the fall of the body, the deha mukti. Uh, and I explained before that Shankara puts unusual emphasis on the deha mukti here for the reasons I described, and that is generally the deha mukti is considered higher, more, more desirable than jivan mukti, while well, you have the body. So this padam, this state, this state which is ambara upamam, the state which is like space, is vimukta deham, the state of videha mukti has been declared by this, by this uh, chapter, which is like space, and that's a nice metaphor because as I said before, in the presence of the body, there is a seeming separation, an apparent separation, a, an experiential separation, which is not real, but it is experienced. How many times have we discussed? Just because you experience it, it's not real. You can see the sun go down and know it's not real. You can experience having a body and experience the duality and separation that requires. But if you're enlightened, you know it's not real. You're enlightened about the sunset, right? Especially after having heard in this class how many times <laughs> I've given this, I have no doubt that when you watch the sun go down, you remember our discussion and you, rem and you remind yourself, oh, it's an optical <laughs> illusion. The sun is stationary in the sky. You get it. You're enlightened <laughs> about sunsets. Good. Suppose you're enlightened about this false sense of individuality. You don't take it seriously. So that's the, the enlightened person's experience of having a body is just an experience. It's not taken any more seriously than the experience of the sunset. Okay? Then, yaditam, what is described in this chapter, is sudrishta shastra anumitibhyaha. It is, it is taught according to sudrishta, that which is well seen, well understood. And what is well understood? Sh uh, shastra and anumiti. Anumiti is another word for, um, for reasoning. So yukti, again and again, we talked about shruti, yukti, anubhava. Shastra is shruti. Anumiti is yukti. Notice he doesn't include anubhava here. Anubhava was discussed in those chapters on Niradhyasana. That's not the subject of this particular chapter. So he talks about Shastra and Anumiti, Shruti and Yukti were the main subject matters of this chapter. Other chapters, especially those earlier chapters on Niradhyasana, talked extensively about Anubhava. So elsewhere, Anubhava has been discussed. And in this way, Naraha, a person who is Nishchetaha, who is well established, thus men in these teachings, that person, Vimuchyate, is freed, is liberated. <coughs> okay. So that brings us to the end of the current chapter. We have a few minutes here. Let me just pause to see do you have any questions on? these four verses that we've just discussed. You're okay? We usually don't take questions. We have a few extra minutes. Yes? Some in the past I heard that Jivan Mukti is more important than Vidya Mukti because we can experience it very fast. Right. But here it's like contradictory. 
So it depends on what is, what is your criteria. One is better than the other according to what. It's absolutely true that Jivan Mukti is more, not more verifiable, it is verifiable as opposed to the fact that uh, Videha Mukti is not experientially verifiable. But verifiable is not something you enjoy. <laughs> it's a proof. So what you said is correct, and that is Jivan Mukti, and le let me just uh, discuss this just for the last few minutes of this class. Jivan Mukti, liberation while you're alive, is experientially verifiable. You can experience that inner freedom. You can know that nothing that happens in the world to your body or mind, none of that affects consciousness in any way whatsoever. It is experientially verifiable. That's Jivan Mukti. Is the Deha Mukti verifiable? As Surya Kant correctly said, no. Because it's a condition after you die. And after you die, there's no verification possible. According to the scriptures, we are told that you're not reborn. And if you ask, how do I know for sure? You can't, we have to admit, it is not experientially verifiable. However, in, de in defense of the uh, scriptures, if the scriptures were right about your true nature being Satchit Ananda Atma so that you can gain that Jivan Mukti, if you are a Jivan Mukta and somebody tells you that, that uh, Videha Mukti is not verifiable, if you are a Jivan Mukta, you'll say, who cares? <laughs> What's the point? So, you can enjoy, and enjoy mean, means you can be blessed by the benefits of these teachings, by being liberated while you're alive. When your body falls, according to the scripture, you're not reborn again. There's no way to experientially verify it that which is absolutely true. But that wasn't my point about Vide Shankara emphasizing Videha Mukti because it's considered superior. And if you remember the argument, it, Videha Mukti is considered superior because there is not even a shadow of separation possible. Right now, there's still, even for, the, for an enlightened being, there's still the experience of duality. Even though you know that that experience is false, it's still present in your experience. And just to amplify that, does an enlightened person experience pain? Ah, an enlightened person won't suffer because of the pain, but the pain is still experienced. The enlightened person will very clearly know that the pain belongs to the body and mind. The enlightened person will know the presence of pain doesn't detract one iota from my fullness and completeness, but the pain is still present in experience. And for that reason, Videha Mukti is considered superior because there's no possibility of pain, no experience of duality, no separation whatsoever. Okay, this is a good place to conclude our class. Um, I'll introduce next week's class next week. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't make sense to do it right now, so we'll conclude with a prayer. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschid Dukha Bhagavit Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om that's it. Very